Welcome back to the Word on Fire show. I'm Brandon Vaught, the host of the show and the content director here at Word on Fire Catholic Ministries. Joining us from Los Angeles is His Excellency Bishop Robert Barron. Bishop Barron, good to talk with you. Hey, Brandon. Always good to see you and talk to you. Hey, before we get to the main discussion today, which is about this awesome interview you did with Jordan Peterson, uh, I wanted to update people on another exciting event that recently took place, this one in Santa Barbara. It was our first ever Bishop Barron Presents event where you brought uh, Leo Labresco Sargent on stage to give a talk, and then you had a, a dialogue with her. The whole yeah. discussion was about how to talk and answer atheism. Uh, how did that go from your perspective? It was a joy. It was a little kind of black box theater in Santa Barbara. We got a you know, small studio audience, but it was being uh, filmed for our institute members and for a wider audience. She gave a splendid talk, 20 minutes, very punchy talk. She's gone from atheism to now ardent Catholicism. So, it, But her talk was not so much about how that happened. It was kind of about the meta issues of how to engage and how to have an argument. And it was a very, uh, I thought, beautiful talk about friendship, really, that this has to take place within the context of a spiritual friendship. And then we had, a, I think, really interesting conversation afterwards. So I enjoyed it a lot. And uh, I think it, it looked great. I just love that that black box, you know, that's the black background and the lights were very good. And so it was just a classy uh, event. So if you're a member of the Word on Fire Institute, you can watch yeah. that whole video inside the Institute. If not, go to wordonfire.institute. That's the website. Sign up. You get access not only to that, but all sorts of video courses, training, and access to Word on Fire Digital, which means every video DVD series that Bishop Barron has ever created, you'll get that in there too. So go to wordonfire.institute to watch that. Okay, Bishop Jordan B. Peterson. So finally, the long-awaited discussion happened. You were interviewed on Dr. Peterson's podcast. We're hoping, mm -hmm. I should add here, that this will be the first of many get-togethers you guys have. More are kind of already in the works. Uh, but I wanted to talk about this particular discussion. It was a lengthy one, a wide-ranging discussion. Yeah. It's about an hour and 45 minutes. I think by the time this podcast episode airs, Dr. Peterson will have shared that interview on, on his podcast. So it should be available um, with a quick Google search. But hey, first impressions, what, what did you think after you finished the interview? I enjoyed it. It was uh, long, as you say, um, but it was very stimulating. We covered a lot of ground. I, you know, read him and watched him a lot over the years, so I kind of knew where he was coming from, but I, I found it very, you know, invigorating. Sometimes you have a conversation that wears you out or maybe it turns into a fight or something. This was the kind that lifts you up and, and you feel, you know, excited about the life of the mind and ideas. And you know, we have a lot of things in common, not, not everything, but we have a lot of intellectual interests in common. And I found him to be a very, uh, you know, kind of gentle, winsome guy to talk to. So um, I loved it. I loved it. He started off the conversation by making this observation. I'm going to play a little clip from it. Okay. People keep writing and saying, you have to talk to Bishop Barron. And then they come up to me and they say, you have to talk to Bishop Barron. And well, I've so, heard the same thing from the other side. Everyone's telling me to talk to you. So it must be uh, in God's providence. I suppose. Uh, at least we could hope that that's the case. <laughs> yeah. So why do people want us to talk as far as you're concerned? Yeah, how would you answer that now, Bishop? I mean, we've, we've been hearing from so many people on our side that you need to talk to him. Clearly, he's been hearing from people on his side that he needs to talk to you. Why is that? You know, I, I, think, I think what I told him in response to that question is he's someone that's opened a lot of doors for people. Um, think of a lot of young folks today who are under the, the weight of this atheistic secularism. Uh, Peterson, to me, he, he opens doors to a deeper consideration of psychological and spiritual matters. Maybe they see me as someone that represents religion in the kind of the full-blown sense. And he's sort of a bridge figure. He's a bridge figure from materialistic, secularist atheism to religion. And I think, too, that, you know, we both talk about, um, you know, these deeper things in a more intelligent way. We both use uh, philosophers and psychologists and probably people hear similar themes, especially now with his interest in the, in the Bible. Uh, that's bound to, to bring him and me together. So I think those are some of the reasons why. You know, a lot of Catholics want to pin him down on what he believes about God, what he believes about Catholicism, all these sort of in questions of interest to Catholics. But before you could even go there, he kind of beat you to the punch. I'm going to play a little clip here where he <laughs> gives his answer to what he says when people 
ask him whether he believes in God. Here's what he says. You know, yeah. people have tried to pin me down multiple times with regards to my belief in God. I actually did a two hour lecture in, I guess it was a 70 minute lecture in Australia about that mm -hmm. question because I thought about it a lot and about, I've always felt imposed upon, I would say, and boxed in when people ask me that question. But I finally figured out that I didn't really feel that I had the moral right hmm. to make a claim about belief in God. I mean, that's not a trivial thing to, to let's say, proclaim. Yeah. You know, because it's not merely a matter of stating in some verbal manner that I am willing to agree semantically with a set of doctrines it means that you have to live you have to commit to living a certain way yeah and the demand of that life is so stringent and so all-consuming and and you're so unlikely to live up to it that to make the claim that you believe, I think is a, to me, it smacks of a kind of, I mean, I understand why people do it. And this isn't a criticism of people's statement of faith. But for me, the critical element of belief is action. And the requirements of Christianity are so incredibly demanding that I don't, see how you can proclaim yourself a believer without being terrified of immediately being struck down by lightning or some yeah. such cosmic. So what do you think of that, Bishop? It seems like he's, his hesitation is that if I say I believe in God, that comes with a whole burden of responsibility to live up to that belief. Well, it's a good instinct. I think that's what I told him as I remember. It's a good instinct. That's right. It's never simply a theoretical matter. I mean, one can entertain the issue of God theoretically. You're, you're a philosopher, you're a kind of detached thinker. But in the religious sense, when you say, for example, credo and unum deum, right? I believe in one God. As Joseph Ratzinger said, that's, that's a revolutionary claim, that you're, you're disempowering all false claimants to ultimacy in your life. That's an existential decision, not just a move of the mind, right? You're saying, I don't believe in this full sense in, in money or power or the state or, or presidents or governments. I believe in one God, unum deum, you know? So I, I like that instinct. He's right about that. And I like the moral seriousness of it. He realizes that's not a trivial claim to make. Um, now, you know, he's a seeker. I get that. Uh, my job, I, I'm in some ways operating in the courtyard of the Gentiles, right? I'm, you know, I, I'm a priest. I, I'm a high priest as a, as a bishop. So I, I am in the Holy of Holies. And that's true, like liturgically. But as an evangelist, my job is to kind of go out into the courtyard of the Gentiles and try to engage uh, people there. And Peterson is, a, I think, a very fine and good and, and um, intellectually curious member of that community. He's not like Hitchens and Dawkins who are, you know, ferociously anti-religious, even though I, I'm happy to engage them, too, you know, as I have very often. So it's simply to say to Jordan Peterson, all right, you know, come on, man, get with it, believe. Uh, here's the argument, accept it. Well, I mean, you, you never deal with him that way. I, I think you, you do it in a much more inviting and indirect and honoring his convictions like this one. Good. It's a good conviction to have. So that's how I look at it, Brandon. He's, he's never, you know, I'll say this to his credit. He's never claimed to be a Christian theologian or that here's... Here's what Christianity really means. He doesn't do that. Like, let me debunk all that old stuff, and here's what it really means. I think he's a seeker. He's a searcher. He's trying to figure these things out. So, okay, I'd say go out from the Holy of Holies, go out to the court of the Gentiles, and meet him. Start talking to him. That's what I've been trying to do. One thing I, I appreciate so much about Dr. Peterson when he speaks is he's so careful and slow and thoughtful and sometimes yeah. that, that makes his speech long. Like I tried to play a little soundbite <laughs> clip and it was yeah. two minutes, you know, uh, but 
you you heard that throughout this hour and 45 minute interview is he doesn't just have these sort of answers that are are prepackaged that he just spouts off he was carefully thinking about everything you said he got choked up several times even on this question when you asked him about his belief in god you could tell his thought was going all the way down into him that it was like an existential question for him yeah and i do i respect that too i i think that's it's not just a um a, a pretense i think he really is kind of thinking on his feet and as he says the words he's trying to find his way it's not like I've got all the prepackaged answers. Let me lay them out for you. Um, so yeah, I, I respect that. Okay, here's another clip. This one's much shorter. It's only about 30 seconds. Um, here's something he said about what the church is missing when it comes to helping young people specifically. So what the church could do better. Here's the clip. And you know, yeah. when I talk to my audiences, it's so interesting. And I think it might be something that the church is missing if I could be so Yeah, bold. go ahead. <laughs> well, You know, I've talked to about 150 live audiences now about this sort of thing, independent of all my classroom lectures. And I'll tell you, I I tell people, I suggest to people that the really, the ancient idea that life is suffering and and that it's tainted by malevolence, that, that there's no more true ideas than that in some base sense. And that that's something that everyone has to contend with. And if you don't contend with it properly, then you become embittered and, and you work to make things worse. And everyone understands that. Everyone knows that's true. And then I suggest to them that the proper way out of that isn't the pursuit of material satisfaction or impulsive happiness or rights from the individual perspective, yeah. but the adoption of responsibility. Yeah. And I'll tell you, Every single time I talk about that, you can hear a pin drop in the yeah, auditorium. No, I yeah, I believe that. And, and I think one of the things that this, the church has failed to communicate properly is that you need a noble goal in life to buttress yourself against its catastrophe. Do you agree with that assessment? Yeah. Yeah, and we talked a lot about that in different ways. Um, The harder edge side of religion, the summons to um, heroism, um, living in a way on the edge, and I think religion does bring you there. Uh, I would say now, and I think I told him this from a Catholic perspective, I came of age after Vatican II, and there was a kind of softening of religion. You know, in reaction to probably a hyper stress, especially on sexual sin, I understand that. Talk to older Catholics about that. But uh, this heroic element and the demand of Christianity was muted. When I was coming of age, you know, God loves you, uh, you're good, you're a good, holy person, and you're, you're in our language today now, you're included and all that. Yeah, 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 fine, fine. That's the language of, of grace. But then grace never leaves us alone. Grace always is, you know, kind of harsh and dreadful, and it calls you to something. And now go out in the deep and go on mission and and realize that you're a sinner. You know, I've identified as one of the most important of the spiritual paths. If you don't realize you're a sinner, then this thing is gonna get dysfunctional fast. Um, So it's interesting to me how an outsider like Jordan Peterson has intuited that about the Christian churches that we've lost something of our edge. And I I think that's quite right. He used the specific phrase that the church is not telling people enough how to nobly contend with suffering and malevolence, nobly contend. And when he said that, I thought of a lot of the saints that we've lifted up at, at Word on Fire as examples of precisely this. Like, I'm thinking of Maximilian Kolbe and how more his story needs to be known, that in the face yeah. of great evil and suffering, he, in a Christ move, absorbs it, but in some way diffuses it through that absorption. He could have just collapsed and said, you know, my life is awful. Look at this predicament I'm in. This is horrible. But he nobly contended with it. And I, I think Peterson's right. We're not sharing that message enough with the church. And that's especially why young men, he's, he appeals to young men, uh, are falling away in droves. They don't find that challenge. They don't find the harder edge. And yeah, Colby, talk about like a spiritual athlete. And what prepared him for that moment? That moment when he came forward at the concentration camp and said, at Auschwitz itself, you know, to say, I'm a Catholic priest. Take me in place of this man. And as you say, that was purely a Christological move. That's a move of 
self-sacrificing love for the sake of the other, even to the point of death, doesn't make one bit of sense within a purely natural framework or a psychological framework. It's only a theological truth. Um, live your life in such a way that it makes no sense unless God exists. That's that line from Cardinal Suar that I've always found very powerful, the more you think about it. If you're living your life in such a way that people say, oh yeah, that makes sense, even if there's no God, then you're not living it right. It's only when they look at you and say, okay, that life is really bad or a waste of time unless God exists, then you're living right, you know? So I, I like that hard-edged stuff. I know a lot of people were hoping that you and Dr. Peterson would talk about the work of Carl Jung, the famous psychologist of whom Peterson is a very prominent devotee, and, and you've uh, taught Jung in the seminary, so you're very familiar with him as well. At mm -hmm. one point in the interview, um, Dr. Peterson says uh, that Jung had a very, he, he describes it as indescribably brilliant view of Christ and the Gospels. I want to play here another short clip and then get your feedback on that. Like, one of the things Jung said about Christ in the Gospels, which I thought was, it was indescribably brilliant, was that Christ, not entirely, but is presented as a figure of mercy. Mm -hmm. And Jung was wise enough to know that, and, and he used religious sources for this idea that God rules with two hands, with mercy and with justice, because if it's just mercy, then well, all is always forgiven and you have no responsibility and you're an eternal infant. But if it's all justice, then look out because every single transgression you, you, you commit, you'll be held to account for in some infinite manner. And people are so fallible that, well, you kind of see that happening in, on Twitter now. You know, if you, if you make a mistake of any sort at any point in your life, you're, you're, yeah roasted over the right. open coals for it and no one can stand that because everyone makes mistakes and so there has to be this balance between mercy and justice and Jung regarded Christ's return in revelation as psychologically necessary because any figure of perfection has this element of the judge because yeah. any ideal is a judge what do you make of that description of Christ Bishop? yeah we had a good conversation about that because I said the master concept. So let's say if you want beyond and inclusive of mercy and judgment is love. That's what God is, right? And love, as I said to Peterson, means willing the good of the other. And that will involve judgment. If you're, if you're willing the good of an errant child, you're going to judge that child, right? Because you want what's best, not just that the child will like me or that we'll have an easy life together, you know, Mercy, of course, because that's that's an expression of your willing of a person's good, but also judgment. And uh, his Jung reference there is to, you know, after all the language of mercy and the death on the cross and all this and shalom and so on. But at the very end of the Bible, you know, we get the wine press of God's wrath and you get the, all the destruction and all that, which Jung read psychologically as as the balancing you know, judgment. Good. Good. That's our tradition holds that. I mean, the, the, the two arms, if you want. I think I made reference, didn't I, to um, True Grit, the, the great film and book, uh, which is deeply biblical, and uh, the two arms of justice and, uh, and mercy. If you only have one arm, you, you can't carry people. You need two arms. So I think that's right. That's a, and I think the corrective we need is a greater stress on, on judgment. Now, you know, like Pope Francis is the Pope of mercy, as was John Paul II. Right, that's permanently valid. And, and we don't want to judgmentalism, that's a one-sided. It's always that delicate balance. And the great spiritual masters know how to strike that balance. Near the end of your discussion, he had this wonderful little clip talking about the adventure of following God. I thought it could have come from the mouth of a Christian evangelist, but uh, here's what he said there. That's the other thing is that one of the things I really learned from reading the Abrahamic stories is that the fundamental call is to, is it called to adventure? Yeah. Not to ease or to happiness. And, and even the adventure, the part of the relationship with God that's part of that adventure is wrestling with God. Yeah, yeah. Right. What Israel itself means is that it, it's another aspect of that strange element of belief is like, what yeah. does it mean to believe? Well, it means to 
adopt this moral burden, but it also means to wrestle with God, yeah. right? And not to, not to blindly accept preposterous blandishments that no right. one with any sense would ever swallow. Do you think he accurately described life with God? Well, well that was prompt, as I remember, by discussion of, of faith. And I, I said that I agreed with him. One of his shows or podcasts, he says, you know, if, if you're accepting things that you know are lies, that's never good for you or for others. Dead right. Dead right. And I was making the point that faith does not mean superstition or accepting silly things or it's not subrational. You start doing that, you're saying, oh, no, I believe it, even though I think it's false. That's bad for you and bad for people around you. And then I said, that's where this came from, that, that authentic faith in the Bible is not that. It's this sense of adventure. It's the willingness to go out from what you know. And that's, of course, his stuff on the hero's journey, which I think is right. And his reading of the kind of the yin and yang of what's known, what's familiar, and what's unfamiliar. And the hero is on the border between the two. He goes out from what's known. And now that's a psychodynamic reading of it. But I said, that's close to what faith means, is the person of faith is willing to, go, like Abraham, go out from what he knows in search of what God's going to show him. That's the duke in altum. Like, I know you're fine here by the shore. You know that world. But now, come on, let's go out into the depths. So to see the full implications of it is to say, I'm not just doing this because I want to be more psychologically fulfilled. I'm doing it because God has called me into this depth. And I'm now going to believe, I'm going to accept, I'm going to go, even though I don't see, right? So it's, it's the, uh, the confidence in things unseen, we hear from the letter of the Hebrews. Good, that's authentic faith. And uh, that's the hero's journey, if you put it in a properly religious you know, framework. I noticed, Bishop, that you guys spoke a lot about Genesis, a lot about Exodus, and even a good deal about Jesus Christ. But whenever Dr. Peterson would speak about the archetypal value of Jesus, how he sort of embodies the hero, making this hero's journey, you would kind of try to press him to the more metaphysical questions. Yeah, but like, who is Jesus? Yeah. But then he kind of pulled back. Did you did you notice yeah. that too? And fair enough. I mean, he again, he's not pretending to be a Christian theologian, but that's, you know, this is the first time we met. And I, I didn't think it was a time to, you know, ask all kinds of you know, real challenging questions. But that's where I would I would challenge him is to say, yes, we can read these stories psychodynamically and you can see Jesus as kind of the archetype of the person perfectly pleasing to God as Kant characterized him. But the fireworks start, you know, when you see, no, Jesus is actually God on a hero's journey, if you want to put it that way, you know, mutatis mutandis. But it's God, you know, though he was in the form of God, did not deem equality with God a thing to be grasped at, but rather emptied himself and took the form of a slave being born the likeness of men, and accepting even death, death on a cross, God's on a hero's journey to find us, <laughs> you know? It's not just the story of our quest for God, but of God's great passionate quest for us. That's what's really interesting in the story of Jesus. So yeah, I would sort of press in that direction. And, you know, again, he's not, a, not claiming to be a theologian. So I think he, you know, didn't follow that prompt. But um, that's where I would keep pressing it, if I could. All right, let's 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 wrap up with this final question. It's one that I think Dr. Peterson has considered a lot in relation to his own work, but I liked that he asked it of you. I don't have the exact clip, but he said something like, oh, what, yeah, what are end. you hoping for in this coming year for you? And what do you think you're doing? <laughs> like, I think he's yeah. trying to sum up your mission. What is it you're about? What is it you're doing? How would you answer that? Yeah, and I, I remember it was at the very end, and, and it did, in a way, you know, put me on this. When you get a question like, well, you know, what do I say to that, you know? Um, and, you know, I guess you have to look at it in different levels. What's the ultimate answer is I want to bring people to faith in Christ and membership in his church. I mean, that's my, that's my purpose as an evangelizer. Now, to get from point A to, to, to point B, there's a lot of area in between. So a lot of my ministry is, yes, with that ultimate goal in mind, I, I want to bring people to salvation in Christ, would be a way to put it. But um, in between, I'm a maybe militant atheist, or I'm a total secularist to that, we got to cover a lot of this ground. And so I said, that's where Word on Fire kind of lives in that space. I, I want to keep going into the courtyard of the Gentiles and keep engaging those that are interested. Um, you know, so it's a, it's a kind of a, a 
proximate answer and ultimate answer. Ultimate one is is fullness of life in, in Christ and the church. But then in between, engaging people in the courtyard of the Gentiles is kind of what I, I want to do. Well, that sound means it's time for one of our questions from our listeners. If you have a question for Bishop Barron, just visit askbishopbarron.com. That's the website. You can record your question on your phone, your tablet, your computer, any device. Today, we have a question from uh, Dwayne from Western Kentucky, and he asks about a word that Bishop Barron often uses, but that he's not sure what it means. So here's Dwayne's question. Hello, Bishop Barron. This is Dwayne from Western Kentucky. Often in your homilies and podcasts, you will use the term logos or the logos. Can you please explain what that means? Thank you very much. Yeah, good. It's because a Greek term, most famously used in the very opening of the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the logos, and the logos was with God, and the logos was God, right? Logos is a Greek term that means basically word. You could also translate it as language or even tongue, like lingua and all of that. Language uh, is related to that word. Uh, Aristotle refers to human beings as the zoon politikon. That means the animal that lives in a polis, right? The political animal, we say. He also calls them the zoon logikon. And we say it, the, the Latinized version is the rational animal. But see, that's too, zoon logikon means the animal with a tongue, an animal with speech, an animal that can articulate his ideas. So the logos is mind, speech, intelligibility, idea, all that stuff, pattern even, um, that God, the Father, speaks his logos, right? And then through that logos makes the whole universe. It's a very important idea. Uh, that's the ground of the sciences, that, that something logical Right. Something intelligible is available in the universe. Uh, Joseph Ratzinger said, when you say credo in unum deum, I believe in one God, what you're saying is, I believe that logos has primacy over matter. It's very interesting that reason or mind is more primordial than matter because it's mind that spoke matter into being and gave it intelligibility. So it's a master idea. And you know, may the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, says Paul. May, may your mind conform to the mind that became flesh in him. So it has all those overtones, I'd say, uh, logos. But mind, word, rationality, intelligibility, pattern, it means all those things. Well, thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Word on Fire show. Again, if you haven't watched the interview between Bishop Barron and Dr. Jordan Peterson, uh, do a Google search or go to wordonfire.org slash Peterson. We'll make sure that that URL links to the interview. If you want to help Bishop Barron reach more people, become a patron of this show. Go to wordonfireshow.com slash patron. Join us and get free books, exclusive content, and a whole lot more. So go to wordonfireshow.com slash patron. Well, thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Word on Fire show, and we'll see you next week.